Hi, a quick question. What do all these systems have in common? Well, at first, it's hard to tell. We have a discrete mechanical system, a viscoelastic material, an hydraulic system, an electrical circuit, and a thermal system. They seem very different if modeled exactly as they are. But wait, what do I mean by that? Well, if we use an appropriate simplifying assumption, we can find a common description for all of them. Of course, this simplification will lead to less general models, but they are still useful ones. In this way, we can describe the interesting phenomena in these systems in the same language, explore interesting analogies, and useful visualization. So, let's start with discrete mechanical system, and then draw the suitable parallels with the other systems. We are trying to describe the motion of a block with a damper and a string when an external force is applied to it. To do it, we start by writing Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. Now, we have to fill in the details. Straight away, the acceleration is a second time derivative of the position of the block. This position is the distance the block moves away from its equilibrium position. Next, what are the forces acting on the mass? They are the forces generated by the spring and the damper, as well as the external force. Thinking first about the string, its force will depend on how much is stretched. So, it depends only on the position of the block. The damper, on the other hand, will depend only on the velocity of the motion. Very fast movement will elicit a strong response, whereas very slow movement will produce almost no force. Now we come to a crossroads. We have here an ordinary differential equation that models the behavior of the block. However, it's a nonlinear equation with respect to the position and its derivative. We are looking for a linear differential equation to be our system. I will explain the rationale in a moment. To proceed, we will assume the block will not move very far away from its equilibrium point, and also it won't be moving very fast. This allows us to keep only the first term in the Taylor expansion of the function describing the force in the string and the damper. In this way, we find the linear ordinary differential equation of the second degree we were looking for. This is our description of the block's motion. But how can we find the solution for this equation? Well, there is no shortage of solution for ordinary differential equation. We will try to use our physical intuition. First, notice one thing. Assume we know the response of the system to a force, call it F1, that evolves with time like this. And another one, call it F2, that evolves with time like this. The response of the system to their sum will simply be the sum of their responses. So, if we could decompose any force input into a linear combination of force inputs, the response we know we will be set. Now, look at this. The force input can be approximated in time using a constant force burst applied during a fixed time step. Applying our previous insights about the linearity of the system, the response of the system would be the sum of the responses to the force burst appropriately shifted in time. Now think about decreasing the time step to be as small as possible. Actually, infinitely small, if that makes any sense. Doing this, the response will now be an integral, the so-called Dumel integral. The only thing missing is the kernel of the integral, the function g, that is, the response of the system to an impulse. This is not hard to find. If you are curious, pause the video. So, the response of a linear time invariant system can be found through the so-called convolution of its impulse response with the input. We now have all the necessary ingredients to better appreciate the parallels with other systems. Let's now look at a different example still related with mechanics. A class of materials that can show a very interesting range of behaviors are the so-called linear viscoelastic materials. They can, in general, display stress relaxation, meaning that when at a constant strain, they will exhibit a decreasing stress response. Creep, meaning at a constant stress, they will increase their strain. Strain recovery, meaning that when the stress is removed, they will recover some of the deformation they sustained. Perhaps the simplest way this wish list can be fulfilled is if the material behaves as the following mechanical system, also called in this context a linear rheological model. This is a so-called standard linear solid, and of course it has a representation as an integral convolution. 
Thus, a convolution integral can be used to specify the stress as a function of the strain history. This means that the overall stress response can be obtained as the superposition of the stress of the responses to the input strains. In the context of linear viscoelasticity, this linearity assumption is often called the voltzmann volterra superposition principle. Here it is more common to use the response of the system relative to a step input than to an impulse, but in the end it's all the same. It can be found from our previous description integrating by parts. As we saw, the convolution is related to linear differential equations. The kernel of the integral represents a mechanical property of the material, the so-called relaxation modulus. One fair question to ask is the following. What relaxation modulus would give us the standard linear model? The answer is a negative exponential plus a constant. The constant with the mention of time in the exponential is the so-called relaxation time. It's the linear extrapolation for the falloff in the stress response to a constant strain. Of course, we could also use two relaxation times and obtain, for example, the so-called burglars material, another very interesting material model. It can also be described as a second-order linear differential equation. Another system that displays a relaxation time is the lumped capacitance system in heat transfer. It assumes that thermal conductivity is very large compared to the convection heat at the boundary. It's a cheap way to model, for example, the thermal efficiency of a building. The equation is the following for the energy conservation equation very similar to the one describing the relationship between the stress and the strain in the standard linear solid. In fact, the corresponding viscoelastic model would be the Maxwell model. Often this is interpreted as an RC circuit. In fact, the equation for an RC is entirely the same. Moving then to electrical system, we may add an inductor and use a voltage source. Looking at the differential equation for a linear circuit, and for our linearized discrete system, we can equate the velocity with the current and the force with the voltage. Actually, an old time term for voltage is pressure or tension. This analogy with the discrete mechanical system is called the Maxwell or impedance analogy. In fact, we can see a string as a capacitor as it stores potential energy, the mass to an inductor as it stores kinetic energy, a damper to a resistance as both dissipate energy, and a voltage source to the application of force as a driving mechanism of the system. The current source is not considered since we are talking about stress voltage driven systems. In the mechanical systems, it would equate to the prescription of the movement and this is our context, the unknown in the problem. Finally, hydraulic system can also be modeled as linear systems, and we can use an electrical system as a departure point for this analogy, since electrons flow in the wires in some way similar to how water flows in the pipes. I know there are quite a few differences, but for our purposes here, it will do. The head pressure is the voltage, the water flow, the electron current, a restricted pipe, an electrical resistance, a flexible diaphragm sealed inside the pipe, a capacitor, a heavy pedaled wheel placed in the current, an inductor, a positive placement pump, a current source, and finally, a turbine pump, a voltage source. The corresponding elements in each system provide the same function regarding the storage and dissipation of energy. The equations are entirely the same. You might be thinking, why would this be useful? Well, in the first place, it can give you a really good starting point to start about thinking a new physical system comparing to a one that you already know and have similar aspects. In particular, it calls to our attention pairs of variables such as force and displacement, stress and strain, voltage and current, which are related to energy. They are the so-called thermodynamic conjugate variables and are essential in the description of the internal energy of a system. They are often thought about as generalized force and displacement, providing an interesting basis for the analogies we found based in ourselves just in the differential equation describing the systems. It's also pretty useful in the modeling needed in linear control theory. Our description of a system composed of multiphysics components obeys a common description and can be discussed using the same language. Considerations regarding causality and stability are applicable to all these systems. They are fundamental if we want to control anything. The two most common types of linear systems 
are of first and second order. In fact, so far we haven't looked at systems of a higher order. We look at the behavior of these two very important classes of linear systems in the next video. Thanks for watching.